Welcome back to 12 Days in March. This presentation, as the name implies, will cover a categorical approach to inflammatory joint disorders for the USMLE Step 1 exam. This is a live but edited lecture recently delivered during an interactive review session at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. So let's get started. If I just do questions, I'm just not going to get the point across that I need to make. So I am going to do review the lay of the land on the inflammatory joint disorders. The information is really well selected. Again, it's from working with students over the years and really just highlight these key association standout features that get you into the right category of disease. So here's the first breakdown, and this is kind of how I want you to do it. These are your inflammatory joint disorders, and it's okay now. I want you to start thinking. Really, we're focusing on initial thoughts when they start giving you joint patients. How acute? If these are days, we're talking crystal or septic. That's your major differential, days like less than seven sort of thing. Subacute, like a couple of weeks. Now we're getting into issues with reactive arthritis. So this the time course for reactive arthritis, and I'll define that a little bit more clearly in a moment. Reactive versus septic versus crystals, the time course kind of gives it away. And then we get into chronic. So psoriatic, angst bond, enteropathic, these are chronic disorders. Rheumatoid, by definition, is a chronic disorder. So when you use the phrase reactive, they're really talking about this post-infectious. Chlamydia, right? So chlamydia infection, your arthritis, can't see P, et cetera. Or infectious diarrhea, Campylobacter, Shigella, you get infected with those. Two weeks later, seven to 14 days later, the patient is presenting with some joint manifestation. Okay, subacute, a little bit later, not acute. So the, the phrase reactive talks about chlamydia, infectious diarrhea, versus kind of enteropathic. Enteropathic is really Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease, give or take ulcerative colitis, more commonly Crohn's disease. Okay, so that's the distinction uh, between enteropathic, inflammatory, reactive, you can still get in diarrhea with different bugs, truly infectious diarrhea. So these are the three players you, the, the students most commonly confuse on the boards. All right. So rheumatoid, simplest. This to me is the absolute prototype in taking the least amount of notes ever. So this is it. This is what you need to know about rheumatoid arthritis. Which joints? I already told you about PIP in the wrist. How many? Lots of them. Is it acute or chronic? I already told you it's chronic. And what are the diagnostics? That's it. You just fill this thing in. We're all done with rheumatoid arthritis. And look at this. I filled it in for you. Um, so the classic joints, MCP and wrist polyarticular. It is a chronic disorder. The only issue about chronic is they want you to be able to distinguish it from infection or crystal. And then the key thing here on rheumatoid arthritis is they do come after you a little bit on the diagnostics. Not on the inflammatory markers, so APR, acute phase reactants. Yes, they'll have a high SED rate or CRP. That's not big time here for rheumatoid arthritis. They, they like much better these autoantibodies. So the derivative questions on rheumatoid, be prepared to answer questions about rheumatoid fact versus cyclic citronellated peptide, CCP. Okay, this is all you need to know. So that's just a quick overview. For rheumatoid arthritis, the key thing is going to be making the diagnosis, distinguishing it from osteoarthritis. And in terms of the derivatives, maybe you should be familiar with methotrexate. Rheumatoid is really more about making the diagnosis. So here goes. Seronegative spondyl arthropathy, this is it. And when I say it's a gateway symptom, since there's really four separate entities that can give you seronegative spondyl arthropathy, it really is an absolute gateway, and I'm talking now about inflammatory back pain. When they give you this symptoms, it allows them to get into all these derivatives. So you gotta lock these on your brain. So insidious onset, big deal, comes on over a period of months, it does persist, because I just said it comes on over a period of months. This is the rheumatologic disorder that affects males more than females, and it's young men. Young men, worse in the morning, better with activity. That's your inflammatory back pain. Um, I'm just gonna digress. It's more than a little digression, um, just on back pain, really for the boards. So we're, gonna, we're talking about inflammatory back pain, but what's your differential on back pain besides discogenic? For a woman, predominantly a woman, osteoporosis, invariably compression fractures. So you have to be familiar with osteoporosis. Uh, you'll need it for the boards for sure. Uh, breast cancer, uh, metastatic breast cancer for the back in a woman. In a male, now, now men and women get multiple myeloma, but for whatever reason, they just seem to save that one for men, and prostate cancer. So those, when you get back pain in an older guy on the boards, it's not inflammatory back pain. Think about myeloma, and they'll give you other bells and whistles for myeloma or prostate cancer. And the other main issues for back pain, Pagets, TB, osteomyelitis. But I digress, because we're really talking about inflammatory back pain. All right, so I told you, you got to speak the language. You won't be able to answer the derivatives if you don't make the diagnosis of sacral aortic spondyl arthropathy from the inflammatory back pain. All right, so what other derivatives? They want you to know about, you know, class one haplotypes. And then think about it. 
the, each of these have their own nuance under the spondyloarthropathy. So psoriatic really is about certainly the rash, psoriasis, uh, but they'll have predominantly dactylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is a multi-system disease, so associated with aortitis. Aortitis ultimately dilates the aortic root. You can wind up with aortic insufficiency. So we have cardiac manifestations. We have pulmonary manifestations, interstitial fibrosis with ankylosing spondylitis. And so that'll bring you to kind of PFTs. And I know it was a long time ago since we did pulmonary, but you have to be familiar with restrictive lung disease. Reactive arthritis, that's we're going to spend most of our time on this one, is the mucosal involvement. The uveitis, the dermatologic manifestations, we'll cover these. Certainly GU, urethra as a mucosal manifestation, but also GI manifestations. And then lastly, again, and I've had patients who came in that have diagnosed sacroiliitis and worked backward to get to their diagnosis of Crohn's disease. The musculoskeletal manifestation of a GI illness, they like that. But it all starts with inflammatory back pain. And although I'm being melodramatic, it's just painful to watch students miss this and not be able to get to the real derivatives. All right, so on the crystals, inflammatory. So we know there's going to be a lot of white cells, 50% PMNs. Uh, But the key thing on the crystal questions, there's generally crystals. We'll describe it on the synovial fluid analysis. Um, You need to know these crystals for gout, monosodium urate, not uric acid, and calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. These crystals are calcium pyrophosphate, and they're buried in cartilage. And the key thing, as I put here, is they'll either give you crystals, but if they don't give you crystals, they give you the inflammatory changes. Key thing is there will be no bacteria if they choose to do some crystal derivative when they don't tell you about the crystals. The main issues with the crystal-induced arthropathies is treatment, and especially, again, it's really gout. They do do pseudo-gout, but the key thing is gout. And uh, with gout, they, they go to the races on your understanding or lack of understanding of abortive therapies versus prophylactic therapies. They give you an acute case, and they ask you the best treatment, and students love, you know, allopurinol and cousins, okay? So you have to be able to distinguish acute abortive therapy in a crystal patient versus prophylactic. All right, back to the uh, joint. So here, when I say there are no bells and whistles to diagnose crystal-induced disease, I just want you to be aware, really, of what's not there. So it is acute. There is no fever. There won't be, on gram stay, no bugs, no high-risk demographics. Um, They won't have that inflammatory back pain, no tick exposure. It's acute, and it's a hot joint, and they have inflammatory synovial fluid analysis, and they're bringing you to a crystal question. Those are pretty straightforward. Septic is not straightforward. There's a couple of varieties that we'll go over. So first of all, septic joint, septic arthritis, not osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, they almost always give you a fever. As I mentioned, there's a predisposing demographic. The synovial fluid, purulent, greater than 75 PMNs. The bugs will almost always give you gram stains, but most importantly, again, there's no crystals. In terms of bugs, your bug is Staph aureus. Okay, that's your default bug, unless they give you some reason to choose Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, so that's septic arthritis, staph. Now we get into the issue of Neisseria. Okay, so now we have a patient who also has urethritis, and we're going to have to distinguish the urethritis of gonorrhea from the urethritis of chlamydia. The patient with septic joint from gonorrhea, it's pretty concurrent, it's now, versus reactive arthritis, that patient who had chlamydia infection, they reported to the College Health Service two weeks ago. So fever and timing matter. Both septic and reactive are going to have urethritis, it's just marijuana. Within the septic category, okay, so Neisseria gonorrhea can do an acute monoarthritis or it can be associated with this symptom triad, the arthritis dermatitis triad, okay, two varieties. So you can get about 40% of the patients who have Neisseria septic joint just have a monoarthritis. What they actually prefer is this crazy triad. Symptom triad, disseminated gonococcal infection, migratory polyarthralgia. This is not, these aren't all infected joints. These are, it's an inflammatory manifestation of being infected with gonorrhea. So migratory polyarthralgia, tenosynovitis, multiple tendons involved. Invariably, they'll give you the wrist is real common. And they have these sterile pustules. These are reactive pustules. Historically, you'd say you could not culture gonorrhea out of these pustules, but now with PCR, you can actually find traces that gonorrhea were there. But historically, they were thought all to be autoimmune manifestations of gonococcal infection. 
just be aware of the two different presentations. And so monoarthritis versus this symptom triad. Again, it's called arthritis dermatitis syndrome. In terms of making diagnosis, chlamydia doesn't do the skin or tendon manifestations. Okay? And then um, here we are, the reactive arthritis. So subacute, no current fever, they had a fever maybe two weeks ago. The infectious trigger, your arthritis or diarrhea, inflammatory back pain. And the other thing with reactive arthritis are these associations, the enthesopathy, and there is a dermatologic manifestation. So enthesopathy, what is it? An enthesis, um, Greek inserting, so site of tendon, ligament, and bone, so Achilles, tendonitis or plantar fasciitis uh, might be offered. You don't really need those to make a diagnosis on these questions, but be aware of it. The other thing is this rash, okay? And people get confused by this, the keratoderma blenorajicum. And again, we're talking about any of the reactive arthritis regardless of the cause. And it's described as this waxy vesicular rash. You don't need this to make the diagnosis, but when they describe a palmar rash or a rash on the soles of the feet, don't be giving the patient a diagnosis of syphilis, okay? It's something else. So those are the joints. That's it. They, they each have subtle nuances. And that will do it. If you maintain an organized approach to the joint disorders, as reviewed in this presentation, you should have no problem on test day. Good luck, and as always, if you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.